afternoon. Thanks very much for your kind introduction. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm Thomas Trimble, and I'm presenting with uh, my colleague Clay Walker to talk about our experiences with um, developing some online courses in the Department of English, and uh, particularly in the General Education Composition Program. Uh, but we want to sort of think a bit more broadly in, um, in terms of uh, the context of student achievement and student retention as it relates to online courses and online offerings. So, we're going to kind of split things up that way. So I just want to give you a quick preview of what we'll be doing this afternoon, and then Clay will sort of get started with his piece. So um, we'll give you just a little bit of context of uh, the institutional and departmental context for what brought us to, uh, to online uh, teaching and the online design of our online courses. Um, Clay is going to talk uh, a bit about the use of standardized course shells uh, as a way of increasing the number of offerings and increasing the number of instructors that can teach. Uh, online. And then I'm going to talk uh, about some early assessment findings from our um, teaching in the fall semester with two courses, English 1020, which I teach, and English 310, which Clay teaches, and also some early uh, retention findings, um, comparisons between students who take our courses in face-to-face -face setting and students who take online. Um, so we'll do the assessment piece. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, the study that Clay and I are conducting and some next steps and revisions that we are beginning to make to the online shelves for these two courses and how that sort of fits into the retention and student achievement picture. And then I hope that we'll have quite a bit of time to, to, to have some question and, and to dialogue uh, around these issues. So I know that this is a, uh, a topic of great interest uh, across the academy and, and here at, at the university. So. I think the more time we get to chat, that I, Clay and I are both looking forward to that. Um, I should also mention that uh, this is um, sort of a draft of a talk Clay and I are beginning at a conference in March, so any suggestions, corrections, ideas that you have would be greatly appreciated. So just a little bit of context. Um, there is increasing uh, interest in increasing the number of online offerings here at the university, as I think there is across the academy. So this is definitely part of the context. This is what brought Clay and I to online teaching uh, and to the topic that we're going to talk about uh, today. So um, we certainly see this as part of a sort of institutional-wide interest and uh, in the topic of online uh, teaching and trying to make this work. Um, we're also trying to increase the number of online offerings that we offer in our general education composition program in the Department of English. These are the two courses that Clay and I teach. Um, so we're trying to increase the number of offerings and we're trying to come up with an infrastructure and a way of doing that in, um, in an intellectually uh, honest and uh, engaged way. Um, Part of that is developing kind of an infrastructure, not only an instructional design infrastructure, but also a professional development in, uh, infrastructure so that instructors who have not taught online before, instructors who are interested in teaching online before, they can sort of get oriented and supported while they teach and while they work on their own courses in a way that's sustainable. So um, a lot of times those institutions like Wayne that are trying to sort of play catch up on the online game, we design something and then we kind of walk away from it. We're, we're, we're not quite sure how to maintain that and create a sustainable system. So Clay and I have thought a lot about that and, and what he's going to talk about in terms of course shells is, is part of that. Um, and then we also want to talk a little bit about the professional development side. Um, in the Department of English we have a robust teaching circle program. Teaching circle is just one way of talking about clusters of instructors who meet on a regular basis. Um, the teaching circles that Clay and I facilitated met on a weekly basis and then later in the semester on a bi-weekly basis um, where we meet with the instructors who are teaching online, what's going right, what's going wrong, what's happening in your sections. So, and we see this as a sustainable model for professional development, not only for uh, online instructors, but for the entire department and the entire teaching corps. But it's been a particular value to Clay and I as we've sort of tried to design this online teaching program in the Gen Ed program. Um, so that's kind of like the big picture, the context that, what, that those are the things that brought Clay and I to online teaching. Those are the things that motivated the conversation that we'd like to start to have this afternoon. So with that, I'll turn it over. So uh, as Thomas said, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the course shells that we built as a way of uh, making it possible for, for us to produce uh, 
a fairly large online program. A number of we sort of in the we had a pilot uh, in the summer of last year where we first developed the courses, and then we ran about uh, I think five sections of, about five sections for each course in the fall. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, general principles of online course design. If you haven't taught online or developed an online course, just to give you a sense of just a quick sense of what that might be like. Some of the goals that we set um, in a little more detail as we started the program, and I'll give you. And really, I'm going to walk you through the templates that we built and just give you a sense of how we approach this problem. And uh, finally, just some of the, the conclusions that we had about the, the um, course shells. So first, some general principles for uh, online course design. Uh, so the first point here, generating course materials, building online courses is very different than building a face-to-face -face course. Uh, it takes an enormous amount of time. There's a great deal of infrastructure that has to be built. Things that you would just do by talking on a weekly basis uh, in, in a live situation has to be thought out, planned out, and written, and then, and then built into the learning management system, which for us is Blackboard. So that so both Thomas and I started working on our pilot courses in February to give you a sense, and uh, and we so we worked actively on those courses. And when the semester, the summer semester started for the actual pilots, we still hadn't finished all, everything for the courses. We were about maybe sixty percent of the way through, I think, or, or so. Um, it's just so it's you know it's very time intensive. Um, so some of the challenges in, in building an online course are. Uh, I think one of the key ones really is predicting and preemptively working around uh, student questions or concerns, trying to think through when a student looks at uh, an assignment or assignment instructions or an outline for a week, what questions might they have and trying to sort of deal with that beforehand. Um, but also not just looking at the course from the student perspective, but also looking at it from the perspective of your learning outcomes, what are the goals for the course. And do the learning outcomes you set sort of at the broad, from the you know the broadest level, do they do they productively work through the smaller learning activities that happen each week over a 15 week semester, 14 week semester? Um, and then finally, uh, another challenge is adapting uh, your lesson plans. So if this is like for, for Thomas uh, in particular, this was a course that he had taught many times. And so adapting some of the things that he liked to do in English 1020 for an online environment um, requires a little bit of rethinking. So one example uh, that I think is a great example of the challenge of adapting to online teaching, the, the generative uh, conversation that will naturally happen in a face-to-face -face environment when you're talking about a reading, just conversation that happens that allows people to share ideas in the classroom and learning just sort of happens people, as people can engage. It's hard to reproduce online, so some, some, some one way to do that is discussion boards, but it offers its own limits. It's never as generative and open-ended as a conversation is in a classroom. So that is um, a challenge. So these are just a little, give you a sense if you've never thought of, if you've never worked in an online class. Now, there's, here I want to talk about two models to think about building uh, online courses. The first is the silo approach. So in this, pro, in this version, so if we're, we're here talking of the context of a multiple section course, like English 1020, English 3010, have multiple sections each term. So each instructor is also the course designer. He or she will work with various people, instructional designers, people at Blackboard, other colleagues, other people in the department to build their own course. So each course is its own silo. Each instructor is building his or her own material, um, you know, maybe in, in relation with other people. Another model is, uh, a, I call this like a team approach, where we have uh, at the center a master course shell. And so here we have a course designer who builds a, mass, a master course shell. And they build this master course shell working with, uh, just like in the silo approach, working with um, various people. Uh, and, and, and then this master course shell gets copied each, each term into individual sections. This is the model we we approached, and, and there's all sorts of levels of formality here. Uh, so some institutions have a, a very high degree of formality where an instructional designer will work closely with a course designer to build a master course shell. There'll be certain things that they'll do together to produce it. Um, <clears throat> ours was a little bit more informal. Uh, you know, one of our goals here was we wanted to uh, produce 
online courses that would be good courses um, and that could work around the fact that building an online course takes lots of time. And, and it just wasn't feasible to support, uh, you know, if we ask, uh, for example, um, you know, part-time faculty or GTAs who may be plugged into a course shortly before a term begins, there may not be enough time for them to, to build the course um, to a high degree. And so one of our goals here was to, so Thomas and I built the first draft of the master course shell, and then through the teaching circles, we worked to engage with the instructors who were assigned for each section. And so we worked to expand that course shell and, and to get feedback from them, to bring some of their perspectives into that master course shell. So sort of trying to make that master course uh, its own sort of, a thing that was sort of distributed by everyone's input, ours and instructors, and that would continue to evolve, not just from one person's perspective, but from all the stakeholders. So we took more of this team approach. Um, so some of the big goals, I've talked about a, a few of them already. We wanted to develop a process for effective course design. Uh, we had, so we started with the pilot, then we went to the multiple section rollout. We had um, an orientation when we first worked with the, uh, I think we had, we only had, um, for the most part, uh, graduate teaching assistants teaching the sections with us in the, in the initial rollout. So we started with an orientation where we talked about teaching online. We gave them an overview of the courses that we had developed. Uh, this was the beginning of the fall semester. And then as the term went on, we met with, in our own groups, on a weekly basis to talk about what are the challenges you're facing in working in this online course. What's working, what's not working. You know, uh, sometimes it's just, what did I overlook? As all of us know, when you build a course, you, you things don't always go as you expect, even after a pilot. Uh, things don't always go as you expect, and, and another structure is going to have a different perspective, and, and students also bring things to your attention. So uh, we had the teaching circles throughout the term. Thanks. Uh, and then we revised the online course materials um, over break, over winter break, in time for the spring term to begin, the winter term to begin. So the other goal was to, in order to, uh, to sort of maximize the effectiveness of our online courses, <laughs> without having uh, a, a large amount of resources to devote to just sort of paying people to, instead of teaching to build on the courses. We built these, these templates. Uh, and so the, what, what we need to do next is sort of walk you through um, so the templates we built. But first I want to talk about this idea of pedagogical agency, which I think this, the template thing raises um, a question here, what does it mean to be a creative or independent instructor? We have this fairly centralized course design system, and we're asking instructors to come in and teach courses that are pretty almost plug and play. There are, spa there are, there are spaces in the course design for them to sort of bring in their own personality. But, but the, the assignment sequence, the reading assignments are already set, the prompts are already set, the rubrics are already set. And so this sort of raises a question of what does it mean to be a creative instructor in an online course? And, and, I, and I'm not going to really answer that question, but as I walk through the template, I'm going to try to show you a little bit how I think we created something that sort of is maybe trying to have its cake and eat it too. It's centralized, but it also allows instructors to, to, to have a place to, to be engaged in their own sections. So, so first, I'm going to walk through some of these. I'm going to switch over to Blackboard in a second, but uh, some of the things that we really focused on were we want the header, and when you walk into the Blackboard classroom, we wanted it to feel like it was a place uh, and it had an identity. Uh, we, we developed a sidebar, so both Thomas's section and my section have the same sidebar, so it's almost like we, there's this, comp this sense that you're in a composition class. Um, and then we, each week, uh, there's a lot of uh, routine in, this, in, this, in the template. So each week has a folder, and each folder is developed in the same order. So students, no matter what week of the course we're working in, they, 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 they can expect, they'll know where to find what they need to find. And they won't get lost, because they don't always ask you questions, and they, that's one of the challenges. Um, and then, um, so I'm gonna hold on to these, I'll point out to them as I walk through. For each assignment, we had, a, this is a, this is just a, a snapshot here of a basic template. So each assignment that Thomas and I developed had this basic, this basic structure. There's a section for an introduction or a rationale for the assignment. Um, and this was a place where we asked instructors, we invited them to, um, to change, to introduce the assignment in their own voice. 
Uh, but the prompt, we asked them to not change um, because the prompt, we felt, was really tied to the learning outcomes. And we wanted to make sure it didn't change in any substantive way. So the prompt is what they're being asked to do. Then we ask, then we give them learning outcomes, which uh, are like maybe finer grained versions of the course outcomes. And then minimum requirements. There's a section for minimum requirements. What's the length? What kind of research do you have to do? What format does it have to be on? And, and so on. And then finally, a due date. Um, and we use this, this version here so we don't have to change everything semester to semester. We say you know, week one, week two, week three. Um, and we can change the dates in the, in the assignments in Blackboard, but we don't have to revise the actual file. So I'm going to go to Blackboard and just quickly show. So here's the header that we, that we created, and this was something that we circulated among many people in the department. Try to get a sense of this is a sort of a way you see English to feel like you're, you're in a place. Um, <clears throat> So in our sidebar, this is, this, like I said, this is the same for uh, all of our, both me and Thomas, we have uh, the same order, announcements, getting started, this just has some material for students who've, if they've never been in an online course before, syllabus and course schedule, course materials I'm going to go in, and this is where students will find all of their learning activities and um, PDFs of articles and, 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 and so on. Um, and then we have a what questions do you have for them. And this is a place where students can go in and if they have a question they can ask it. Anybody can respond to it. Just a place where they can feel like they can get some feedback. I'm going to go to the course materials folder and <clears throat> walk you through this. So each week has a folder. And in each week we built um, first an overview. And then the, the overview has this calendar which syncs up with the broad, the, the main course calendar. Um, and we have learning objectives. Uh, and these will be the things that students will be working on through that week. And, they will, and, and, the, and these learning objectives also will, well, they tie in with the assignment. So students will see this, you know, one or two of these on an assignment during that week. Um, um, and so the week, the resources folder here, we have uh, video lectures. This is another place where we ask instructors to, we ask the, the, the instructors we work with to, to produce their own video lectures where they would talk through readings or assignments or you know, whatever topics were set for that week, produce their own video lectures. So students were getting something besides text in the course. Um, also, their students can find in there any um, supplementary readings that weren't in the textbook. And then we have assignments here, and you can see um, what the template sort of looks like filled out. There's an introduction and a rationale, the prompt, learning objectives, requirements, and due date. So, uh, so our goal here was to we're trying to help students know where they what they need to find, um, and um, but also for instructors who aren't familiar with words in online courses too much, we've we've sort of tried to sort of create a, an online course that prevented any serious problems for both, I guess for both ends, students and instructors. Um, okay. So finally, so all right. We tried to improve the workload using the template system, uh, seeking an, you know, an overall quality. So we have multiple online sections, which we hadn't had before. Um, and the teaching circles were key with that. So some of the things we found, um, some of the teaching circles worked. So it really depended on how engaged those instructors wanted to be in the teaching circle. One teaching circle was very vibrant and robust and was very successful. Another one was very much less successful. Uh, and I think that translated to in better revisions for one course than the other in the fall semester. Um, another thing, uh, I think another outcome of this model is there's, a, I think, a better sense of shared ownership. Everyone had a stake at what the course looked like. So they walked into the beginning of fall, but they knew that, you know, in the winter and future semesters, what this course looked like, they had a, they had a stake in what it would look like, what things they could change. Uh, the, 
the plug and play course design facilitates transition to online teaching. So for even for uh, one of our lecturers, she'll be teaching one of these courses this summer and she's never taught online. So it's a great place for her to get a feeling for what that's like because it is very different than teaching face to face. The course is already built for her and um, she can focus more on just learning how to build relationships with students and to do all the teaching work online only. Um, but one of the challenges though that I want to talk about is that some of the instructors that we found in our teaching circle, some of them saw it as an opportunity to teach without teaching. Uh, and this is something that we tried to work with based, because it is already built. At first they have this feeling like, well I don't have to do anything because the course is already built. But um, that's one of the limits that you, we had to work with to uh, show that the, there are there is still a lot of teaching work for you to do. Um, okay. Yeah. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our early um, assessment findings um, with our experience in the fall. And we, Clay and I, were both motivated by two fairly simple questions. The first is how are students doing? So um, when. Um, Clay and I both have experience with both of these courses. We've taught the face-to-face -face version, so we want to know what differences are there between student outcomes in the online courses and the face-to-face -face courses. And then Clay also wanted, uh, we also wanted to sort of ask ourselves, how are we doing um, as a department that is trying to increase and develop a, offerings and develop an infrastructure for developing offerings, how are we doing? Um, not only at the front end, but also in creating a sort of sustainable system. So these were two questions that kind of motivated us. And so some other questions that we wanted to ask ourselves. So I'll keep this very brief, um, a literature view. Uh, Clay and I have read a bit into the literature on online teaching, and particularly as it relates to outcomes. Not a ton, we have more reading to do. Um, but there seems to be some consensus broadly that if you take a look at student satisfaction outcomes, and student learning outcomes, that there are no huge areas of difference between students in face-to-face -face courses and students in online courses. Now, if you take a look at individual courses, individual institutions, individual instructors, just like a traditional face-to-face, -face, there are differences, right? There are bad courses. There are bad instructors. So you can find those. But in terms of a broad category, face-to-face -face versus online, at the current time, there seems to be no obvious differences, either in terms of student satisfaction or in terms of student learning. There's actually a website created called nosignificantdifference.org, which I invite you all to take a look at if you're interested, which is basically a huge collection of pieces with some commentary that makes this argument that if you compare face-to-face -face and online broadly, there are no stark differences. However, if you take a look at the literature, there are a couple areas that are causes for concern and that Clay and I became interested in over the course of our experience in the fall. One of these has been suggested by an article that Sapp and Simon wrote in 2005. They looked at English courses and math courses at a four-year comprehensive school in New England, and they noticed differences in grading outcomes uh, and completion rates between students in face-to-face -face courses and online courses, and we're we'll talking a little bit about that. And then there's a fairly large study that was done by the Community College Resource Center in 2013 that also took a look at this question about grading outcomes and retention outcomes and noticed some big differences, some significant differences between face-to-face -face and online. So with the CCRC study, I don't want to sort of create a false equivalency here um, between the community college and four-year institutions, research institutions like Wayne. Um, there are big differences, um, but it's to some extent, if you think about community colleges sort of functioning as the canary in the coal mine on things like retention and college readiness and that sort of stuff, there are some data coming out of work at the community college level that gives us a bit of pause that I think we need to pay attention to. Um, and uh, so that will sort of, that's kind of the gist of where we think the literature is and that's some of the motivating questions for Clay and I. So I want to come back here to the study by Sapp and Simon they did in 2005. Again, this was at a four-year comprehensive school. 
And what they found is they wanted to sort of look at what they call the thrive or die phenomenon. And this is something that they had started to hear about within teacher lore and anecdotal evidence from teachers who taught online um, that kind of resonated with Clay and I just a little bit, is that in online courses there seems to be a pattern. You have students at the top we call thrivers who need very little direction, Sometimes you don't even know that they're out there, and they turn in great work and seem to do just fine. But then you have this group at the bottom, that we call divers at the bottom, who don't do so well. You never hear from them. They don't submit work. They don't log into the course. To some extent, they're kind of invisible, and they don't do well at all. The idea here is that in an online course, that this, the course kind of gets bifurcated. So you've got these thrivers at the top and these divers at the bottom and a narrow band of what we call survivors in the middle. So what Sapp and Simon found is that they looked at a first year writing course, very similar to our English 1020 course. And what they found is when they compared the face-to-face -to, -face to online sections, they found a drop, a 45% drop in the number of students who thrived at that top. When the, for them, they defined it that B plus or higher in terms of grade level. Well, they also found a 33% increase looking at the online section of students who they call divers. These are students who failed. These are students who either failed the course, dropped, withdrew, just did not complete the course. So that's, right, that's stark. So I want to go back to the CCR study just for a moment, and then we'll move on and look at our data. Um, the CCR study noticed a 9% jump in the failure slash withdrawal rate in what they call gatekeeper English courses, their first year course. This is the difference between students in the face-to-face -face courses and the online courses. They also noticed a 13% jump in the failure and withdrawal rates in students in gatekeeper math courses. This is their first year math course. And this is something that started to catch my eye, is the CCR study also found a 4 to 5% increase in the number of students who were not retained from one semester to the next. So those students who took an online course in one semester, they might have taken other courses as well, but they took an online course those students were not retained as well that next semester. And I'm defining kind of retention as you enroll for anything that next semester. So I'll talk about our retention numbers in a minute. So if a student took a course in the fall semester, if they took anything in the winter semester, any course, we consider them for our purposes as being retained. So Sappins, or the CCR study found a decrease in retention just for having taken an online course. So whether that was the fault of the online course, you don't know, but there's a correlation there that's that we need to pay attention to. So Clay and I ask ourselves this question when we took a look at our students is, was there a difference in grading outcomes? And did we see a difference in retention outcomes between the students who took the course face-to-face -to -face versus students who took it online? So our study design, um, Clay and I basically looked at all 1,800 students who took English 3010 and English 1020 in the fall 14 semester. These are multiple sections. I forget what the total number is. We're talking about a lot of sections, 1,800 students. We only looked at the fall 2014 semester because that's when we rolled out our online sections. And then we looked at pass rates, retention rates, and the grade distributions and the differences between the students in the face-to-face -face courses and the online courses. So first of all, I want to take a look at our English 1020. This is the course that I taught. So again, we're, this is kind of a replication study of the methodology that Sapp and Simon used. We took a look, we sort of tried to divide the, the students into three categories, what we call thrive, survive, and die. For those students at the thrive level, that's a student who get A, A minus, and B plus. Survivors are B, B minus, C plus, C. For us in English 1020, C minus is considered a failing grade, so we defined dive as C minus and below, including those students who dropped and those students who uh, had an incomplete. I don't think we really had any incompletes, though. So for us, when we took a look at the difference for the 1020 students between face-to-face -face and online, we saw a 28% drop in the number of students who thrived at that top level. 
So Sapp and Simon suggest that the classes would bifurcate between thrivers and divers. What we found, we actually found a decrease in the number of students who achieved at that highest that thrive level. We saw a slight increase of 10% at the survive level, but we saw an 18% increase in the number of students who basically failed the class. Again, this is either because of the grade they got, or they withdrew, or they just never submitted anything, but for some reason made it to the last day of class and still showed up on the roster. If you take a look at the bottom row, just in terms of the numbers, we had 1,200 students, or 93% of our overall take the face-to-face -face course. So 7%, we still had a fairly small number of students elect to take English 1020 online, but it was one, two, three, four, I think six sections. So we're dealing with not an insignificant number of students. So a little trouble. So this is English 3010. This is, uh, this is Clay's course course that he designed. These numbers are not as dramatic, but there is a s sort of pattern here. So in 3010, we saw a 3% drop in the number of students who thrived at that top level, a decrease in the number of students who survived, but an 11%, remember it was 18% for 1020, we saw an 11% increase in the number of students who failed the course, again comparing face-to-face -to, -face to online. We had a slightly higher percentage of the total students who took 3010 elect to take it online. 13% total the students who took 3010, 30% took it in an online section. So at least on the face of it, we see this, an increase in divers. Now I want to talk just a little bit about retention. I'm going to talk about retention. These are students who took the class, took a class in the fall, but then didn't, haven't registered for anything this winter. And the institutional context here is retention is a huge issue at Wayne, right? We have a retention crisis that we're working very hard on at the institutional level, the department level, college level. We're working very hard on this, but we're very concerned about it. But we also want to increase the number of online offerings. But so if retention is part of the picture, we take that very seriously. So this is English 1020. This is our basic composition course. So just look, that second row there is the pass rate. We have an overall pass rate in 1020 of about 79%. If you take a look at just students who take it face-to-face, -face, it's right about in there, 81% passing rate. But then if you take a look at the overall pass rate for 1020 online, again, it's the same class. We see the pass rate dips to 62%. Now if we take a look at that last row, which is retention. These are the number of students that actually take another class the next semester. We saw an 11% increase in the number of students who don't take a class that following semester, those students in the online section. And then I want to sort of talk about the, the bottom piece just for a minute. For those students who failed English 1020, the retention rate for students who took it face-to-face -face was 64%. So 64% of the students who failed the face-to-face -face version still came back to take some class this winter. But the retention rate for the online students in 1020 who failed is 50%. That means only half of the students who failed online sections have registered for anything this winter semester. It's a little better for 3010. We have a pretty similar pass rate in 3010 of about 80%, but we did see a drop in the pass rate for students who took the online version. And we also saw a small 6% drop in the retention rate for students who took it online versus those students who took it face-to-face. -face. I'll come back to that failure bit. So for those students who failed 3010, if you took it in a face-to-face -face section, 70% of those students came back. They're here registered for something this semester. 65% of the students who failed the online version of 3010 are back registered and taking some course this current semester. So not as bad. It was 50% for the online versions of 1020, 65% for the students who took the online versions of 3010. So we color coded these in red just in case. The <laughs> uh, we also administered a survey instrument to the students in the online sections. It was the same survey instrument administered by Sapp and Simon. 
Um, and this tries to get at some of the attitudes that our online students have about the class. Um, we had a fairly low response rate. We, uh, we sent the survey to 160 students. Every student who was registered for either 3010 or 1020, we only got back eight responses. Um, but what's interesting is 100% of those people responded said they got it, were gonna, expected to get an A in the course. That doesn't mean they did get an A, but it means they expected to get an A. These are our thrivers. Our thrivers are the only people who want to take the survey, which is not surprising, right? That's interesting. 88% of the students who responded, again, we're only talking about eight people, so eight, you know, we don't want to just, I don't want to overstate this. They said they did not get to know their fellow students, and I think the instrument actually says at all. Did not get to know any of my student, fellow students. 63% said they did not get to know their instructor at all. But 100% said they'd take another online class at Wayne State, and 88% said they'd recommend their friends take an online class at Wayne State. Interesting. So again, these are our thrivers. These are the people who said, you know what, I didn't get to know my instructor. I didn't really want to know. <laughs> you know, it could be, I don't know. So that's interesting. So for Clay and I, who are now invested, deeply invested in online offerings, we are on board. Obviously, we have two questions that we're very concerned about. Why are students failing at a higher rate? We don't know. Um, there's some suggestions out there in the literature I'll talk about in just a minute, but we want to know why is that happening. We also want to obviously know is what we can do as instructors and course designers to increase the pass rate other than making the online version easier, which we don't plan on doing, but we, how, so how do we do this? There are some suggested interventions out there in the literature, on, and many of you are probably already familiar, have heard of some of these. One, expanding online orientation offerings to students, so students know at the front end they can decide for themselves, is online, is an online course really for me? So we have a piece in our designs that, um, that OTL has helped us with uh, that works, but we think maybe we can customize that a bit more for English and for our courses. Incorporate more face-to-face -face meetings between instructors and students. Um, this is fine if students are in the area. If a student is, is commuting remotely, computing remotely, that's obviously much more difficult. Um, Sapp and Simon recommend more real-time activities. So where students or activities are happening, not asynchronously, but in real time. Uh, they also recommend, and this is sort of widespread across the online literature, providing online or prompt feedback to students as soon as possible. Uh, and Clay and I, have both, all of our instructors have heard this, students really appreciate, they need that feedback. And also that in, in institutional support. So not only for instructors, but also for students. So Wayne has right, a wide variety of support services for students. Are there support services specifically for students in online courses? That's a good question. The CCR study, the community college study that I talked about a few minutes ago, kind of similar things, increasing this instructor pr presence, increasing the use of interactive technologies like Skype or Google Hangout. Uh, Clay uses VC, which is a teleconferencing tool. Um, and then increasing that inter interpersonal connection, not only between instructors and students, but students, among students. So Clay and I are thinking about incorporating some of these revisions into the course designs for both 1020 and 3010, it, revising and sort of customizing the orientation activities, uh, setting up more instructor-student conferences, opportunities to do that, increased opportunities for student collaboration, um, and then a couple that I want to talk about real quick, is the use of kind of a scaffolded course specific intervention system um, which is uh, I'll get the fancy way of saying you call students on the phone so uh, you, if you call a student on the phone they kind of freak out mm -hmm. right so I've had moms and dads and aunts and uncles like go wake someone up and say your teachers on the phone <laughs> hey right that's so one thing I'm trying to do this semester in my own section of 1020 um, is I've got this week one, I call it the failure to log in email, which is, right, course semester starts, two days go by, and I can look at Blackboard and see that they haven't logged into the class. I send them an email and say, hey, I noticed you haven't logged in. It's time to get going. I think some online students think, hey, it's online. I don't have to check in until week three. Mm -hmm. Our course designs don't work like that. So letting them know really early, time to get going. Then I have the failure to turn in first assignment email that very first week. All they have to do is create this little online profile of themselves. It's easy to do, but a lot of them don't do it, so they get an email and say, I noticed you didn't submit your 
you're out of profile. Then I have the failure to turn in the second assignment mm -hmm. email. And then things step up a little bit. This is, again, within the first two or three weeks of class. I have the missing work phone call. And I call them and just say, hey, I'm an instructor. How are things going? Try you know, start personal. And I say, hey, notice you're not submitting anything. What's going on, right? We need to, we need to get going here. And then students will have different stories. Like, oh, I didn't think I, you know, I thought I could just check in in a few weeks. Like, well, no, it's not the way it works. That kind of, you know, kind of stuff. And then I have this pre-drop deadline phone call that I just made a couple weeks ago. These are for the students who are not turning stuff in. They're not logging in. I'm not hearing from them. They're not responding to any of my emails. And I just say, listen, the drop deadline is right around the corner. Somebody is paying for a lot of money for you to be in this class. You need to make a decision. You need to make it right now. Right? Are we going to get going with this thing? Or are you going to drop? And I don't really encourage them to drop. But I say, we need to talk about this right now. And I use that as an opportunity. It's like, why don't you come in and we'll sit down face to face if that's possible. Let's talk things over. I don't know if these work. We're going to have to figure out if these things work. I hope they do. We, we think they might, but we're not sure. We'll have to figure that out. <coughs> so next steps for Clay and I. Uh, we're going to have to look at our fall 14 uh, SET scores, our stu uh, student evaluation teaching. We haven't seen those yet, so we don't know what that data is going to show us. We are collecting the same data, winter 15, in terms of we're going to do the comparisons of the grading outcomes and the retention outcomes. Uh, obviously, we won't know about retention until the fall. I don't think we're going to look at spring, summer. We'll look at the fall, so we'll have to see how that shakes out. Uh, and then we're going to see if there's any difference between these kind of like in-class interventions, the emails and the phone calls. Maybe that will tip things one way or the other. Again, we hope so, but we're not really sure. And then Clay and I have also invested in, along with the other people who teach this class and who are going to teach this class, in sort of the ongoing improvement and revision of these shells. Um, we're learning stuff all the time. Again, we're trying to, you know, students, they didn't figure this. We thought this would be obvious, but it wasn't obvious. So making those changes. The shells are not static, and so, and, and there, so there's, a, there's a maintenance uh, function there that requires kind of constant attention. So this will be happening over the past several months. Next. So with that, how are we doing? Um, any questions or thoughts or concerns? I'm the chair of the English department, and I'm very proud of this work by two of our lecturers. And, uh, um, but what's interesting to me is, is uh, one of the things I tried to do uh, before I was chair was director of composition, and I tried to address grade inflation. And so I set out guidelines uh, and uh, for you know grade distribution and in, the, in the various classes. I put it in the common cells. I frightened people. Uh, by doing so, but what's really interesting about your your data is that the online courses look more like the guidelines in terms of grading distribution than the face-to-face -face courses. Mm -hmm. And so I think there there might be something uh, going on in terms of you know establishing a personal relationship with the students individually and the students in your courses that generate more grain inflation and the anonymity of, of online courses that actually uh, you know produce a more reasonable number of, of A's and an increase in the numbers who are really getting B's and, B's and C's while still passing the course. I don't know how you investigate that, but it, I, I think that that's probably the next Hi. Um, I'm wondering how much you use video um, in your online courses. Do you use, do you give video feedback to students, or do you do like video introductions of your weekly modules? Um, in 1020, I think 3010, we um, in the Blackboard, the the landing page is the announcements page, and most of the 1020 instructors, we would um, Blackboard now has a great thing where you can record directly to YouTube. Um, which is, and we would have like a weekly announcement. So I'd say, hey everybody, it's week two. It's a lot of work this week. If you have any, remember if you have any questions, I just posted feedback to so and so to check that out. And then that announcement would be there in the announcements page, but also would get emailed to students directly, depending on students what kind of devices they're using. Sometimes they can see that video right on their phone. Sometimes they have to backtrack to Blackboard to take a look at it. So they see that. 
Um, all of us, I think, finding things that one of the projects we do in 1020 is a film review project. So I, you know, inserted a video clip for Gene Siskel talking about film reviews and that sort of stuff. Um, in 1020, that I, I don't think any of us have yet used video in terms of assignment feedback. We've done that. Um, I know there's literature out there that say students really prefer both written and video or audio feedback. We're not doing that right now. That would be really interesting. But we're trying to do as much video so students can see us talking. And then the lectures that we use, um, uh, I've currently used the Echo 360 to record narrated uh, PowerPoint presentations. And different instructors are using different platforms to do that as well. So we're trying to. This might be a related follow-up. Um, I, so I also take a lot of time to write really detailed instructions so that students know exactly what I expect from them. And I had a student um, say to me last week, he said, you know, we're the generation that speaks in 140 characters. So the more instru instruction that you give us, the less of it we're probably going to read. So, yes. <laughs> so I don't know if you found that at all in any of your courses as well. I've never thought of that. Yeah. I mean, that's what, particularly in our, you know, we can be, I think we can both be verbose, so, I mean, you know, so we worked on trying to create, you know, we have this distinction between like thin assignment descriptions and thick assignment descriptions, and that's could be really hard, because we, you know, you want to give students as much direction as possible, but it's like, yeah, I only read the first sentence of each paragraph, so. Right. <laughs> so it's hard to say, I don't think, we, we really don't know either what they're doing. Yeah, in terms of using, we, we know in student, like Blackboard, you know, if a student has logged in and looked at something, you know that, but you don't really know how they read it. And um, unless you get questions that say, hey, how do you do this? Like, that was, right? Did you yeah. see that? Yeah. Apropos of students reacting or not reacting, do you, I understand that on the whole, online courses get much less in the way of course evaluation feedback. Are you finding the same thing? How, do, you know, do you get, do you ask for the sets? Do you get the sets? Different pilot. Yeah, we got a low response rate in the summer when Clay yeah. and I pilot, piloted the course. We haven't and seen. You don't know for the fall, we don't know right? for the fall yeah, yet. But you know, the only eight students took the survey. That's an yeah. early indicator. I maybe. was thinking about yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. I've been teaching online for about six or seven years now. It's basically the same gen ed course and some other offerings. So I think I can respond to a few of these things. Um, your intervention points, yeah. I find really work. I do the same thing, like at certain key points I say, you know, I haven't heard from you, or you know, you've never logged on. And I, so I do send the emails, and they do tend to work a certain percentage of the time. There are still students that you will just never hear from. Yeah. Um, I think another, um, when you're talking about evaluating, yes, the set, they don't fill out the set things and they don't do surveys unless you give extra points for it. So if you give them extra points, they'll do it. Um, another thing though, when you're comp um, comparing retention and, and grades, I think we need to keep, or what I find, we need to keep um, aware of the demographics of the student that take online courses. And because I usually ask them to do the introductory post and say a little about them and if they've taken other online courses or not, and a lot of them have taken many, but you also find that a lot of them have special circumstances of one kind or another that make them maybe different from general population. So a lot of them have um, health disabilities. A lot of them live, a very, you know, like more than an hour away, um, if not out of state, especially summer students tend to like get jobs in Florida or whatever. Um, they've just had new babies, um, they work full time and this is the only time they can get in. So the retention I don't think is as comparable as you think it would be. I think that's a good point. Because they might have dropped out of school for very different reasons, having nothing at all to do with having taken an online course and been disappointed in it or whatever. So I don't know that there is a strict correlation. To add to that, as, as, you, as um, you would think, and you were talking about improving your course. I find that every time I offer it, you, you'll get a student that doesn't understand the way you, you wrote the instructions, and they think, oh, okay, coming from that point of view, maybe if I wrote them this way. Right. So you're kind of always kind of picking up, and then I ask my students that take 
have taken other online courses, what they find effective about mine or not effective or um, something that they have found in another course that they really liked. What else was I going to say? Oh, and then I always post, again with the instructions, before the course even opens, I post a welcome page. Mm -hmm. That's just, you know, the kind of, hi, how are you? Yeah. But then gives the instructions of this is a totally online course and there are assignments due every week to kind of eliminate that, geez, I don't really have to get the book right away, I don't have to start reading. We, we do an email uh, at the beginning of the term that kind of lays that out. This is a structured yeah. course. Well, there are due deadlines each week. But to speak to the other issue, uh, we also found in the fall that uh, we learned at some point in the fall that, um, well, first of all, these courses fill up very quickly in registration. And we, I don't know if we were aware before that, that honor students and athletes had the first pick. And so our courses were largely filled with these two sort you of... You can get around that, though. Well, and, and it, as it may be, that was the sort of one of the circumstances yeah. anyway in the fall. I think they're, I don't, we haven't looked at it formally, but... Um, but it, that, that, that does seem the courses tend course. to fill like within minutes, so if you get around having all other students and, and athletes, you can post the um, like we usually post it at thirty or the cap, and then wait till it opens again, and then up the post up up yeah. the cap to thirty five, and then I always take as much as maybe ten per ton overrides because you get a high drop rate too when kids yeah. start taking the class and realize it's going to be a lot of work, get a lot of students drop in the beginning. I actually have a question kind of related to that, um, to the idea of looking at uh, transfer and retention. Um, I wonder if you thought about it from the other end, where online course offerings are actually a recruitment strategy. Um, I know, uh, and this is anecdotal evidence, right? So I'm, I, I don't know if you guys could look at this in the future, but most of my student teaching cohort when I was an undergrad, um, we were taking online courses at other institutions, uh, like other than our degree granting institutions, because we had um, gen ed courses yet to fulfill in order to graduate on time. And so it was very useful for us to say, pick the, uh, the local state university uh, that was downtown that I could still go to for a beginning and end of semester meeting, but could just take one course online. It would easily transfer to my liberal arts college, um, and you know all was well. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if perhaps there's a way to look at um, whether or not the students taking these courses are taking a course at Wayne for the first time mm -hmm. ever, or if they're coming from other institutions. Okay. <laughs> Did you, have, did you want to respond to that? Um, well, I had I a, heard I mean, kind of a follow-up comment, too, yeah. that fits into this whole thing about enrollment, right? Because I, um, as you know, we also piloted some literature and writing courses um, last summer for the first time. And um, I haven't looked at the fall data, but I did, I, I ran numbers for summer. And um, I, I didn't do the Thrive, mm -hmm. I, I didn't do the three categories. I did two, uh, pass, meaning a C or higher, and you know, C minus, or which, and below it would draw. And for the face-to-face, -face, uh, for this group of classes that we teach, the face-to-face -face classes, there was a 76% pass rate and a 23% C minus or below. And for the online, it was 70% and 30%. So um, uh, online was slightly, worse, but yeah. not a huge amount worse. But what I wanted to say was the online classes were so popular that we had more students per class graduate, or not graduate, uh, you know, pass yeah. the classes. So that number overall, because the online classes were attracting more students overall, more students were completing that general education. Yes. And I think that's an important number, too. But I don't know. Um, to, I, I don't know whether those were. I think they were mostly Wayne State students. But we were also the committee that uh, I'm on that was we're discussing these. We're also wondering about 
that? How, how many are we getting from other institutions? I haven't noticed any getting any from other institutions in the courses that I've done. I teach out the anthropology department, though, but there's a gen ed course and tends to pull from the Um, have peer mentors in the English department, and do you, you, you utilize those in online sections of your classes? We do, we, we, um, some of our colleagues just started a peer mentoring program, but we did not make any use of peer mentoring in our courses. Uh, you think about it, that's a great idea. Because uh, I, um, my program just went entirely online, just um, starting the fall. Yeah. And in the fall, I had a peer mentor that didn't really have her doing much with my online sections, and this semester, um, they're doing a ton of interventions with students, and I've noticed a dramatic difference already just in one semester. That's great, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have oh. a question about the oh. mechanics of doing these shell courses. Where do you house the shell? <laughs> it, Blackboard. On Blackboard. So it's just kind of a... But do you house it in your account? Yeah, but we well, added lots of folks, so Clay is on my course in the department. Because eventually, over the years, after so many years, it'll disappear. Um, this is a non-term specific course, so I okay. believe it'll. So this is the 3010 online built here, and this is Thomas's 1020 master shell, and so lots of people are have access to it. Um, I believe it. Maybe there's a limit. I'm not sure. That's a good point. There is a time limit. Yeah, I've had that same problem. I created the shells, and then I've gone along to teach it myself for the last five, six years. Yeah. And the shell, of course, has disappeared because it was the old one. So if someone wanted to come in and teach that course, I don't know how they would have access to that shell. They have access to one of my. They could be given access to one of my ongoing courses. You could just renew it. You can I mean, you just, really? you just pull yes. it up. But yeah. Don't let it archive. It's every five years, I think. So you just copy it over to this year, every two ah, or three years. Okay. And then it'll stay there as long as you want it. You exactly. Of course, copy is very easy to do. Right, right, right. Especially if there's nothing in it other than just shell stuff. Yeah. yeah. Or you can uh, repass the long-term course, and you can just go course copy. Yes. Or build that non-term of course that does not get required. That makes sense. Thank you. Oh. I was wondering in your research, was there um seems like logical or in English here? <laughs> um, seems like I'm taking a guess here is that the higher the English course, the closer those numbers from face to face to online are going to be. Mm -hmm. So they're probably not recommended for the guys who are No, uh, and 3010 is an interesting course that fulfills the university's IC or intermediate constitutional requirement. You have some students who take that course right away, right after they take 1020, and then other students who um, take it later on once they've declared a major. So you see a much more spread in uh, the ranks, uh, the rank of students in 3010. So it'd be interesting to figure out, you know, we know that the longer students are here, the better chance they have of, of getting to graduation. So, um, but no, that was not a part of our study, and, but um, that would be something to take a look at as well. You mentioned self-assessment. Um, have you made it available to students before they enroll in your course, or is the self-assessment after they enroll in your course? Because it may be that they need to check their assessment to make sure they're maybe completing on that course before they even enroll in the course. The orientation, the way that we built it right now is the orientation activities are, they're, um, we send them an email like uh, the week before the class starts and say, start this, check out the getting started stuff, and then it's required during the first week, but we haven't done a great job of monitoring how many students are using those resources and doing the self-assessment. Um, my gut would be a lot of students are either browsing it or not doing it at all. So we could probably do a better job of monitoring and having some sort of assessment activity to make sure that the people are doing those activities. All right, just make it available for someone before they even register yeah. to go online. Are you ready to take an online course? And right. they just complete it and then get the results right then? And that would sit outside of our Blackboard, oh, it would sit outside of registration that they could do, right? That That's a good thing. I know one of the teachers in, in our department has uh, an assessment thing like that in the beginning of once the course starts, but you cannot 
access the rest of the course until you pass that. Yeah. Until you can answer those questions. Yes. And then the rest of the course will open for you. Yeah. We're good. Thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate it.